Thanks everyone for coming out to, tonight to uh, Hill Holiday. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jamie Shai. I lead a multidisciplinary design practice here uh, at the agency. It's essentially a design consultancy here within the agency. And I'm really thrilled to be partnering again with the Design Museum to put on another event here at the agency. Uh, it's such a great organization. And we have a really fascinating topic uh, to discuss tonight and a phenomenal panel uh, to, to hear from. So enough about me. That's me. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Joe. Okay. Hi, I'm Joe Coughlin. I'm founder and director of the MIT Age Lab. Uh, we study uh, essentially how do we design 100 years of quality of life? And we look at transportation, housing, the workplace, and well-being. So don't ask us about either hair replacement, as you can tell I failed in that department, <laughs> or what vitamins to take, but how does technology, design, and business innovation come together to invent life tomorrow. I also teach in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and the lab is based in the School of Engineering, but we draw across MIT, Harvard, and all the other schools in the area, as well as five different countries. All right. Robots. Oh. Lots of robots. Huh. Chris. <laughs> Hopefully you digested all of that very quickly. <laughs> we'll come back to the robots. Yeah. Uh, so Chris Carter, I co-chair the Mayor's Office of New York Mechanics for the City of Boston. We are uh, an R&D lab embedded inside City Hall. So uh, a team of uh, about 12 people, and uh, we have kind of diverse backgrounds as well. We have people who are teachers, we have designers, we have uh, novelists, filmmakers, um, folks that uh, you know spend time as firefighters, a whole sort of range of backgrounds to help us think through uh, what's new and next in cities and how do we make the lives of people that live in Boston or visit Boston better. Um, what's flashing on the screen here are shots of cars that are, uh, trucks that are driving themselves. Uh, our office, along with the Transportation Department, has embarked on supporting autonomous vehicle testing in the city of Boston. Uh, you saw a, a quick picture there of Mutonomy, who one of those partnerships is with. Uh, and if you look out the window behind you or did beforehand, uh, you potentially could have seen them driving around the Seaport District right now. The reason that we're sort of invested in uh, testing uh, autonomous vehicles here in Boston, it, it, there's a large number of reasons, but principally through a transportation planning process that we got input from you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of residents over the last two years, they wanted their streets to be safer, they wanted their transportation system to be more reliable and more accessible. And when we sort of look at those three boxes, uh, the potential of AVs is to check all of those uh, and significantly uh, improve the lives of people living here uh, by, by allowing this sort of technology to evolve here in Boston. We also know that Boston is a pretty hard place to get around. Uh, human <laughs> drivers struggle with it. Uh, pedestrians are, are independently minded here, so are cyclists, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Um, so we know there's significant challenges that we have to overcome, that driving in suburban roads in California is very different than you know, uh, doing that on our streets here. Uh, and as my grandmother used to like to tell me, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. We all learn from dealing with, uh, with uh, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a firecracker. Uh, you know, we spent the past five years understanding what uh, transportation network companies, ride hailing companies, uh, sort of mean to cities. And uh, maybe we're caught a little bit off guard on, on that and we feel like we really want to be at the table for this as it evolves going forward so we can hopefully shape it in a way that uh, achieves those goals we're hearing from people. Independently minded is a great euphemism for Boston drivers. <laughs> I like that. There's lots of ways you can get in trouble talking about the way people move around the city. <laughs> as vague as possible. And I'm Betsy Goodrich, and I have a company called Manta Product Development in Kendall Square. And um, I'm an industrial designer by background. and. Came out of a company called Continuum, yay! Now located <laughs> down here, um, but really am interested in how technology affects people. Interested in learning about the technologies, helping them be something that can work to benefit people, um, make our lives better, make them great. Um, this is one. Uh, we got started early on in kind of the interest in robotics in the field. This is a. Uh, Probably the one we're best known for, which is Baxter and Sawyer, Rethink Robotics. So cobots, you love them, you hate them. Are they going to replace our jobs? That's going to be part of what we talk about tonight. All right. So let's get into it. Just, just to kind of set up the conversation, um, I thought I'd share a couple of things that I've ripped from the headlines recently. So we'll do a speed round of last week, tonight here. Um, we're in a time 
of really unprecedented change in the world, and it's only going to accelerate. Uh, and I think what we'll talk about today is really an enormous topic. We're going to try and break it down into uh, a couple of very large topics, uh, autonomous vehicles and workplace automation, and really dive into what are the perhaps unforeseen uh, second order consequences of some of these trends that may not be immediately obvious to um, those of us that are not thinking about this every day. We have a panel of experts here to really help us unpack some of those topics. Um, but just to kind of get a glimpse of, of where we are right now, I mean, it, some of it is exciting, right? A lot of it is, is exciting. When we see things like predictions that by 2030, self-driving cars are going to account for 95% of the mi miles driven in the US, that's not that far away. Uh, and yet, everything that comes along with that is going to represent radical change in our day-to-day -day life and so much more. Uh, IoT and smart home automation are going to change the way we live. You know, this is the promise of automation on the, on the upside. That all sounds pretty good. Uh, AI is changing advertising. That's, that's our business. That's what we're here for. Um, that sounds pretty cool, right? Change is good. Except when we see this, <laughs> especially with this audience. Robots are coming for our jobs. Wait a second. Adobe is building AI to automate web design. I thought Adobe was our partners. You guys used their suite, but they're looking to put us out of business. Resistance is futile. <laughs> well, I'll give someone who would agree with you. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw this headline from over the weekend, but Elon Musk was being interviewed. He said, AI is a fundamental existential risk for human civilization. Robots will do everything better than us. It's a little daunting. <laughs> On the other hand, as part of a marketing organization, I see what the robots are putting out right now. And I don't worry that much. This is an actual ad I was served the other day uh, from Amazon that was clearly written by an algorithm and spoke to me on a deep emotional level based on my affinity for HDMI keyboards. <laughs> um, and we have robots yeah. in other places in our lives, right? We're all familiar with security robots. Not exactly RoboCop, but seems pretty cool uh, until we find out that they have some different kinds of tendencies and an inability to identify stairs, apparently, uh, or a desire to become a robot Michael Phelps. <laughs> Dream on, little robot. Uh, and so this is the world we're living right at this particular moment where these are the two headlines at the top of Twitter just a, a, you know, <laughs> within hours ago. Um, what are we to make of the situation that we're in right now? Uh, we're going to try and answer some of those questions for you in the next 30 to 40 minutes. And uh, think of questions as we go, because there will be a Q&A at the end. So um, feel free to, to jump in. With that said, I think we'll get started and just dive right into the, the first big topic, which is autonomous vehicles. I think it's one of the things that's really exciting. We, kind of, we know it's coming, and so we can kind of see it coming down the road. But what it actually means for us day to day um, is a little bit harder to predict um, and kind of imagine how it might change our lives. So Joe, if you don't mind, let's, let's sort of do a little bit of a scenario here. I'm a, I'm a you know, Boston area resident. I may be commuting in from the burbs. I drive in to work during the week, maybe come in on the weekends to do some shopping or go to the aquarium with my family, something like that. Let's say it's 2025, 2030. Paint me a picture of how my life might be different from today. Am I still driving my, my minivan? It's just, there's no steering wheel? Uh, what else has changed? Um, first off, thank you for uh, putting this together and having me here at the Design Museum and all the sponsors. Um, you know, I, I think that the forecast of 2030 being 95% on the road is a little bit heady. Um, we certainly are going to have autonomous vehicles. We have them now in certain degrees. Uh, but the George Jetson, that shows my age by refer referencing a cartoon that most of you don't remember. Uh, but the George Jetson scenario of having the car pick me up and take me away, it's going to be slow in coming. Not because the car won't do it and the technology won't do it, but the infrastructure is deadly lacking and it's gonna take a long time. Even the cars that we have today that can drive autonomously are relying on the highways being well painted, well marked, never raining and never snowing. Uh, I think we may have a problem with that in the New England area because the way it maintains its way on the road is how well it sees. So at 25, 2025, 2030, yeah, if the day is good and the roads are better than they are today, it will be taking that wherever we wanna go. I think the autonomous vehicle, though, provides a great opportunity that designers and policymakers and business have never really had before. We actually can get a glimpse of where technology is going in the near term. And if you think about it, the automobile changed society and our landscape profoundly for the last 100 years. We've got a little bit of a jump on what this could mean. So let me just give you kind of an idea of where designers can go and we can share the conversation. 
there's at least three different levels of design problems or opportunities with the car. I'll start from the inside out. The first one is, what's the inside of that car going to look like? Because if you are not driving, let's go with that level four or level five automation, which means you do nothing and you can sit back there, you probably won't have the steering wheel. But what do we do? Does Hill Holiday have a screen in there for endless advertising for the half hour, hour commute that you have? Do you have a bar that is installed in there? Because drinking and driving is now a cool thing. Um, you've got a 30 inch screen where you don't just text, my God, you're creating everything you want while you're sitting there. Or you're sleeping or doing whatever else. Will you need a rider's license for your, ride, your driverless car? Because it will break down. So what do you do when that happens? So designing inside experience. The outside is not just what will it look like, but how do we design the transportation infrastructure? What's going to be different there? From parking to highway to the vehicles themselves. You know, one of my students actually looked, do you know that if you took all the parking spots in the United States, put them together, that would be paving the state of Connecticut? So we can talk about what that opportunity is, but also how do we design that space? And then finally, what does this mean? The urban planner in me wants to know, and you kind of led me down that path, so to speak, is we know that everyone is saying that we're all moving to the cities. Well, you can see that a lot of people are moving in the cities. By the way, if you check the census, not everyone's moving into the cities. Um, a lot of them are staying in the burbs for a variety of reasons. They can't offload the homes because a lot of people are moving in the cities and the like. So let's imagine the current commute right now for, say, I don't know, 22 miles western suburbs, northern suburbs, takes you about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how good the traffic is that day. The vision of an autonomous vehicle is you're going to go 100 miles per hour, bumper to bumper, while you're sleeping, doing your mail, whatever it is you want to do. Here's one scenario. Everyone moves to the city. We don't own our cars. We go from restaurant to boutique to coffee shop to work. It's great. And urban planners celebrate that. They light candles at night. Now let me give you another one. 100 miles an hour, bumper to bumper. How many of you like the beach? How many of you like the mountains? Wouldn't you love to have your job right here and be able to live in Vermont? You can do it. Because the mobility budget, we know there's something called Marchetti's Constant. Generally, people are willing to travel about one hour throughout history. So if I give you one hour, at 100 miles an hour, suddenly I'll commute in from Newport. Some of you will commute in maybe as far away as nearly near Albany or the Berkshires. So all of a sudden, the discussion of is all going to be urban and it's going to be tight and it's going to be small. I don't know. One scenario could be you're not driving in from the suburbs to go to the aquarium. You're driving in from Albany to the aquarium to go to work and then going back home. So those are three design challenges for you to think about. The car is coming. The infrastructure is not ready. And I don't know how many of you are going to trust your vehicle every time you think about the blue screen of death on your own computer, <laughs> thinking that that's the same code being written into your car. That's a, a great picture of the landscape there. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm so excited about this particular panel is we have perspectives from academia, the public sector, and the private sector. Chris, how do you think about uh, a couple, some of these scenarios and what does it mean from the city's point of view? Um, I, I know that there are some really interesting pilots happening in Boston right now. And as you said, Boston has a kind of a love-hate relationship with cars today. What's the, what's the optimistic scenario and the pessimistic scenario from your perspective? Yeah. Well, we stop thinking outside of our border of the city, so we don't have to worry about people commuting into the Berkshires. Never come. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for, for Boston, I, I mean, we are experiencing rapid growth. The, the, fastest growth in population since the 1940s uh, in the city, right? So we're going to hit 700,000 people by 2030, um, which it hasn't, there haven't been that many people in Boston since like 1922 or something like that. So uh, the, the pain that you are feeling in trying to find workspace or an apartment or a house in the city is real and it's probably going to get worse unless, you know, we, we start tackling it. Uh, and we are, right? We have some plans in place to do that. And some of them is around mobility. Um, I think you know, from a public policy perspective, there are lots of those design challenges and there are infrastructure challenges for sure uh, that the city's gonna have to grapple with. Uh, but we don't have the money necessarily to tackle those infrastructure challenges if this comes on the, in the same model that private vehicle ownership has in the past. Uh, we rely on a gas tax now, uh, that's at the state level, right? Which brings in about $750 million a year into the state and then shared out to different cities. In the city of Boston, we bring in about $135 million in ex excise tax parking revenues and 
uh, ticket revenues. Raise your hand if you've gotten a ticket <laughs> in Boston. <laughs> Thank you. You funded our schools, our cops, our firefighters, uh, all those things, and, uh, and, and our roads and our bridges. And, uh, and if that all goes away, right, because vehicles no longer have a need to park uh, and are operating by all the rules of the road, uh, which is great, that's the intended purpose of doing tickets, but we, we don't have that revenue in place. So where does that revenue come from to do the infrastructure, and how do we use uh, the stick of government, you know, uh, some sort of regulation and pricing to make sure that we get the outcomes that we've heard from the public? Uh, so that's one option going forward, right? Do we, do we move more towards vehicle miles, travel, uh, pricing? Do we charge based on weight of vehicle? Do we charge based on the number of occupants you have in your vehicle? Uh, and, and how do we sort of do that in a way that incentivizes people to travel in a responsible manner? Uh, and I think that's a big challenge you know, for the city, but also you know, transportation is a regional issue. Uh, and we, we don't have a great governance structure uh, in Massachusetts to, to tackle it at a regional issue. You, know, you go out to a, a West Coast state or, or the city of Phoenix, I mean, the city of Phoenix is eastern Massachusetts, right? Um, we're 58 square miles here, right? So we have to figure out how to work collaboratively with all these other governments to achieve sort of uh, the, the outcome that we want to achieve. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, that works well, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, you have your own car and you, you live in the mountains or the, uh, you live by the beach and you commute in for some subsect of the population that can afford to do that. But government's job is actually to be you know, working for everybody, and particularly those that are most vulnerable. Uh, when we look at the income inequality gap in Boston, it's not that different from other major metros, but we are one of the worst in the country, right? So the, the Gini coefficient, uh, so the top 95% uh, make 18 times more than the bottom 20% in Boston, which is bad, really bad. And those people rely on public transportation to get to work, to get to school. Uh, to sort of uh, get to their kids' soccer games. Uh, so we need to be investing in public transportation as well as investing in the roadways. But that public transportation has to come first because that's, that's the most vulnerable population. The average commute for somebody in the city of Boston is 28 minutes, so less than an hour, so it's pretty good. We have one of the best walked uh, modes place in the country. About 16% of people walk to work in the city, which is amazing. Uh, better, than, better than New York City. Um, but if you live in Mattapan, the southern portion of the city, and you are disconnected from uh, the red line, your option is sort of a, a bus for the most part. The average commute there is much longer, and a full quarter of the people have a commute that's well over an hour. Uh, and that's the population we need to be using this technology to solve that transportation problem so that we can talk about uh, providing sort of equal access to jobs and uh, education for, for them. From, from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, what do you see being some of the more that's radical yeah. Outcomes potentially. Uh, so one of the reasons that we're doing testing with Mutonomy and Optimus Ride and Delphi is actually to get feedback from them about what we shouldn't be investing in. Um, you know, I, I spend a fair amount of time listening to smart city pitches, uh, which, which have great design work for anybody that's doing design work for smart city companies now. It's fantastic. Although it needs a few more people in them. It's usually like the fast moving light, you know, uh, city scene. But you know, I don't think we're confident that the technology has evolved enough where we're going to put, uh, you know, Internet of Things widgets all around the city and it's going to, to work right now. I think what we're, we're thinking the right play is at this moment is uh, better markings on the road, which helps everybody, whether you're a robot or a human. Uh, better signage, which again helps everybody, whether you're a robot or a human. Uh, and then uh, wiring the sidewalks, which we haven't really done with fiber and constant electricity. So a lot of the street poles in Boston um, only get power certain hours of the day, right, when the street pole needs to come on, which presents a problem if we're trying to stick something up there, uh, you know, to, to be able to communicate with an autonomous vehicle that there's a pedestrian walking down the street or there's a bike moving at high speed towards that intersection. If it's only working at night, that's an issue. So uh, I think we're thinking about what are those investments we need to make now and It'll take us 10 or 15 years to lay out fiber throughout the city, uh, but we can start now, and there's, there's at least some money in the capital plan to begin that work. Betsy, based on your background as a designer, when you think about a problem that is this big in scope, or problem's not even the right word, opportunity, you know, uh, tidal wave that's coming, um, how do you try to break down some of the dimensions of this into things that designers, maybe some people here in the room, might be able to start to wrap their heads around or, or chip away at? I think coming from an industrial design um, 
point of view, you know, we're, we're very interested in the tangible object and what the relationship is between people who use it and that object. And so that's a very personal relationship. We typically have owned things. So now we're talking about interfacing with systems that we don't own possibly. And what is that relationship? Um, a lot of the history of industrial design is car design, which is now transportation design. But in the early days, the famous designers did cars, and they personalized them. And they were you know, something you really, really wanted to express yourself through by having a car, whether it was powerful, whether it's electric, whether you know, whatever model you pick is a reflection of you. So you know, we don't have that same connection with the T. We were talking earlier about how you get on the tee, and it's just like, it's just a way of getting there. You know, it can be pleasant, it can be unpleasant. Um, and we do, as designers, worry a lot about equality in the system. So, you know, yes, having a Tesla is a beautiful car and really cool because it's embracing great new technology. And I especially like technology. But I'm very worried about the people, um, whether they be elderly or kids, or all of us who need to get someplace in the city and knowing. I think an average commute from someplace like in Rosendale, where I am, to get into the city is at least an hour, hour and a half, depending on if you take a commuter rail, you take the bus, you take, if you don't have the money to go Uber or to go, you know, buy a taxi, if you still do that, um, you know. <laughs> It's, it's an expensive world and a time-consuming world. So our transportation systems here are quite expensive. We've also got a push and pull issue with transportation and land use. You don't know which comes first. So as the city, this city especially, is growing so well, it's also getting very expensive. Will you now take your autonomous vehicle out to where you can afford property as far as possible to commute back in, right. using that one hour to get what I can buy? So, you know, and I think a lot about, you know, people who are elderly. What's the classic thing you have to go through with an elderly parent? You have to take their car keys away. And that's a horrid thing. It's a loss of not only um, kind of control in their life, but access. So how I love autonomous vehicles is the idea that there is a way, a safe way, for them to get to where they're going. And then as you think through that scenario, you know, where are they going? Um, we could learn a lot from the patterns and optimize different things like how to get them more social engagement and you know, do you have a ride share thing where it picks up all their friends? It's like, I mean, the mind runs wild on how that could be a positive experience. But on the other side, it could also be tough because if you have somebody whose capability is fading a little bit, can they navigate a system? Can they get where they want to be? Does this give them new routes to go get lost? So, <laughs> um, but. I like it also for people who don't have to have a car. So I think it's really great that you have a series of different systems that you can access, whether it be public transportation or you know Uber, or this thing is going to be there. You can go get it. You can whistle. It comes, and it'll take you, and then you don't have to think about it. So if the price can be something that we can accommodate different levels and allow people to get around and get to other people, I think that's great. I want to rip, uh, there was another piece that Joe talked about, about the interior design yeah. of the vehicle. Uh, and we have a partnership with the World Economic Forum sort of looking at this topic. Uh, so we ran sort of focus groups this past fall. And what came up again and again for, particularly for women in those focus groups and for people with families, is that the design, the current design of the vehicle doesn't meet their needs, that if it's a shared, uh, you know, Lyft or Uber or whatever it might be that they get into, and there's now no driver to set the social norm in there, they would not use that service at night. Um, and that there needs to be some sort of configuration of a cab, you know, or the vehicles need to have at least, you know, six or eight or ten people in them for them to feel safe. So there's all this sort of, you know, human design research that needs to be done about when you remove the driver and this sort of sense of social norm from, a, from that place, what happens. Yeah, you, 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 you're talking about too is that are we are we going to if you instead of owning your car have a sharing economy of basically I call my Toyota on my wristwatch and it comes and gets me whatever. What does this mean for public transportation? Because isn't that public transportation for one or three rather than sixty of my closest friends on the bus? Yep. And does that erode some sort of uh, social fabric that we have that occurs through these chance encounters on public transportation or walking or biking? Um, we were talking about this earlier, but this idea of sort of meaningful inefficiencies in life 
Uh, and we talk about that a lot of our work, which is maybe not a good thing to say publicly about government, but uh, <laughs> this idea that, there, that we should be focused on creating at least some chances of meaningful inefficiency, the sense of wonderment or the sense of creative friction or, or this opportunity to interact with a person that you may not otherwise do that. And public transportation is an amazing example of that. Uh, in Boston particularly, because it's often the fastest way to get, you know, assuming you live on one of those lines, the fastest way to get from A to B. So you mix in, you know, on the red line with everybody, you know, from Quincy to, you know. So, so I'm going to tease Chris for a second on that one. How many of you have a iPhone or something you listen to in music? I'm that creepy guy on the T that took a picture of you. We were all alone together. We were all wired in, and we got our phones like this. So we're together. But I, you know, I'm not. It's it's funny how we've had yeah, time yeah, on yeah. yeah. But I love meaningful point efficiency as a as a design criteria, perhaps for solutions going forward. Um, such a huge topic, and we're sort of starting to get bigger and bigger with it. I want to bring it back so that we have some time to talk about workplace automation. But I hope for all of us, we're able to see how this is a topic that affects us not just as designers, not just as consumers, but as citizens as well. Um, and I'm sure you'll have, you'll have questions as well to to build on. Uh, shifting gears a little bit to another era, area of potential uh, opportunity or terror, depending on how you look at it. Um, the robots are coming for our jobs, probably. Some of them, maybe all of them. Uh, let's unpack that a little bit. So uh, we've seen automation in, other, in, in certain sectors of the economy for a really long time. I mean, sort of we've been building tools to help us be more efficient um, since we have the capacity to do that as, as a species. Um, but it's really starting to accelerate and, and creeping into areas that we didn't necessarily <coughs> uh, expect to have automation at least so quickly. Bessie, you know, you have experience working with uh, robotics in particular and kind of the human machine boundary and, and <coughs> partnership, um, which is, you know, robotics is an area that's been around for a long time, but it's really starting to take a new shape. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you're saying? Sure. I mean, I think one of the most interesting things about working on uh, Rethink Robotics, Baxter and Sawyer was going out initially into the field. I mean, this company started, had a technology, it had an arm, but they had no idea really how to make this thing something that people would feel comfortable around. That's why they have a facial display. They, you know, we've tried to make them red and cheery and friendly and worked very much on whether or not the robot, you know, can work at a human pace and still be effective. Um, what people who are going to be handing, the idea of this type of robot is that you very quickly can teach it a task. Like it's going to pick things off a conveyor belt, put them in front of an inspection camera, decide if they're good or bad, and put them in one or the other place. And it'll do that all day. It'll do it as long as things come down the line. And talking to people who did these jobs, some of them were very afraid, but they all admitted that it's hard after an eight hour shift to come back and do that again all day. And that they like the job of actually going over and bringing things to the robot. They liked interacting with the robot. But that um, the other side of this was really looking at what these robots could do to the company. And there's companies, and I'll quote Yankee Candle, because when we first went out there, some of their people were very afraid and then they told us a story where there was a new scent that they wanted to bring out for the holiday and that they couldn't do it because they didn't have enough people to work the line to get that scent out in time. So for that company and small companies that want to make something but just don't have the people, it's really good to have something that'll just do that manual task for you. And that extends kind of into what are those tasks that we want to do? Do we want to pick grapes? There are robots now that can go into a field and start to pick grapes very effectively. It's going to save the wine industry in Australia because, again, they could not get enough people to come in and do that job. It also does jobs that aren't safe as well. So I think it's a lot to do with how we design it, what kinds of things we see as valuable jobs for people to do what kind of training we give people so that they can feel like they are going someplace with it. Um, because most of these jobs that, say, robots like Baxter and Sawyer can do are not something you want to be doing forever and ever. Um, you really want to have something more meaningful in your life. So how do we supply that when we take these other jobs away? Yeah. So Joe, you know, I'm in a creative field. A lot of us in this room are. It used to be there's a robot over there. <laughs> my question, which was, we're safe, right? No, actually, none of us are safe. 
Because if you think about it, those parts of the creative, there are, you know, there, there's the creative thing that we celebrate in, in the creative arts, if you will, that, that moment, that, that fun of, of coming up with a new idea. And then there's a lot of doing something over and over and over again until you get it right. Very task oriented. So if it's done over and over and it's task oriented and an algorithm can figure it out, guess what? You're about to be outmoded. And so yeah, the robots are coming for all of us. Do you have a site? Do you have the uh, clicker? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Show you a, a few of uh, our coming replacements. So there you go. We've got the basic robot that can be in your mom's house to remind you to take your medication. There's one robot called Pepper that will insult you and tell you jokes to keep you socially engaged. So it's not just a service robot. It's got a sixth sense of humor. Go to the next one. Uh, cobotics, which is what we've been talking about, which is kind of helping you stay in the workplace longer. So one of the reasons why robots are so important in the workplace and why they're coming anyway, Believe it or not, there is not a long line of younger people to take the jobs of older people in many, many professions. So as a result, we're looking to robots to, shall we say, keep people on the line longer. So you're all saying, well, I'm a creative type. I'm not a factory worker. Well, OK, we're moving up the line. We're moving boxes. How about Flippy? Flippy can do hamburgers much faster than anybody else out there. It is now moving into restaurants, not just in the United States, but in Germany. My favorite, because this is how I help pay for college. Next one. Oh, sorry, not this one. This is from a strange hotel in Japan. Do not laugh at her. She looks a little pale. But how many of you can speak 26 different languages? Can you check in guests at the front desk and hand off the bags to a robotic uh, bell clerk that will take the, the bags to the room? Uh, it's already up and running in Japan. They're looking to open up three more hotels. Next one. And this is the one I'm particularly fond of. Unfortunately, he would put me out of work. 250 drinks within a half hour. Don't know if it tells jokes, but it's a real problem. And finally, the last one. Your look, too. Yes, well, I know. It's a stylish <laughs> robot. But I guess what I wanted to get to is not just a creative type. This is kind of a mock-up. But there are already attorneys that have been replaced by robots. In Chicago, an entire appellate division of 50 lawyers was eliminated by one robot. We saw it today in the news. A couple of us saw the same piece, which is a robot that was designed out at Stanford actually now is doing everything from uh, parking ticket appellate work and the like. So yeah, the creative part is going to be the one thing that if you can keep running faster and faster, that you'll be able to compete against the robots. But here's the new competitive edge I think all of us are going to have to keep. One, we're going to have to keep on learning faster and faster than we ever did before. Secondly, being the most human you are may mean now this new strategic advantage. In fact, one of the things that we were saying when we were preparing, something you may not expect to hear from MIT or any discussion about robotics. Your strategic advantage, we may see the rise of liberal arts come back up at a rate that you've never seen before in your life. So while STEM education is absolutely necessary, needed, and imperative for a society to grow, we're going to now find that the one thing that robots have a hard time competing on is empathy, humor, and being able to relate to the people that are receiving the service. And lastly, as a design issue, one of the things I'd like you all to think about as designers is automation and robotics a new medium? This is not just a thing doing work. It is a thing that is personality. It relates to you. You begin to trust it. You want to bring things to it. So this is a new thing you're going to have to design into the environment as much as color, space, design overall. Chris, I'm going to ask you to put on your politician hat for a second and give <laughs> a soundbite answer to a very thorny uh, public issue. But if robots are controlling government, we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> But is no. there a way to frame how we think about this from a policy perspective? That uh, yeah, you know, what, um, what politician have you uh, not heard talk about jobs on a campaign trail? Um, so I think there, there's going to be a lot of really meaty policy discussions about what this does for workforce, uh, you know, over the over the next few decades. Uh, but this is not the first time we've gone through an industrial revolution. We've done three so far. This is kind of the fourth, right? Um, and the income inequality, though, it's yeah, it's gotten bigger time, and bigger. You know? Yeah, so it, and you, you kind of heard it, right? The the jobs that nobody wants to do, or those low end sort of task related jobs, are often a way for someone to sort of climb up in society right now. And that is a real risk, right? So, what, what else can those uh, people go and do? Drug racing. Immigrants? <laughs> Drug racing. <laughs> I have a question for people to think about: Who's going to protect the robots? Let me give you an ethical scenario. If you ask you as a designer or anything in any workplace and you're feeling tired that day and somehow you get the robot to do your work, 
Who takes the credit? <laughs> I mean, we have HR to go to to protect us, but is there going to be robot abuse on the job in terms of who's getting credit, who's getting promoted, who's working 24-7? Mm -hmm. I the, think... No, so I was just going to say, there was a fascinating discussion on GitHub uh, kind of relating to this, and somebody that had, I don't know if, yeah, had automated their job uh, and could do it in about five hours a week now. And they were having this moral decision about whether they should tell their boss they worked remotely. They should tell their boss that they'd automated their job or not. Uh, and they really just wanted to spend more time with their kids. And, and so like you saw this community, this sort of tech community, advocate on both sides of this. That it was, you know, like you, you needed to, like your ethical responsibility is to say, yes, uh, you have figured out how to do this better, and now you're ready for your next task. And other people were saying, no, go spend time with your family. That's, that's what you should do as a human. That is your right to do that. You, they ask you to do one thing. You figure out how to do it the best way. The European Commission is talking about giving robots human rights. So if we cheat them at work, <laughs> you, you know, might get sued for you know, yeah, exactly. IT. Well, I think about how the four-hour work week was a bestseller about eight or ten years ago, and yeah, that was a celebration yeah. of finding ways to cut cords on yeah, the job, yeah. but yeah. not through robotics. It's an mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. spectrum. I, I think I like to think about assisting <laughs> robots. You know, robots that can help us. I think it'll be a period of time until they really fully replace us. <laughs> and, and at that point, maybe we can't distinguish, and maybe we are living longer because we are partially robotic. I think that that's actually a real trend. It will see it's farther out, maybe not for me. But. I think that's a bit, the McKinsey study says something like 5% of all jobs can be fully automated, but 50 some percent can be partially automated, right? So it's more that cobot right. uh, future that we've been moving towards. So we, we think a lot about you know the elderly and how they could be assisted in their daily activities. And we worked on a companion robot years ago, um, and it was a really interesting ex exercise because, you know, yes, there's you've fallen and you can't get up, but there's now we're trying to come up with interfaces that replace people or help you connect to the people you love and keep you abreast of what they're doing and them abreast of you. And if you have fallen and you can't get up or you can't get out of your bed, you start to lose mobility. So how can you know really smart wheelchairs or lifts or things like this enable you? Or exoskeletons. I know they all look really kludgy and like you're supposed to be a battle bot, but you know, the trend will be, and it's not just electronics and it's not just software, it's materials, and there's a lot of work to figure out how you make something and and I definitely do see those things becoming a statement of who you are. My one concern is who can afford them and how we make them accessible to everybody. That's a, that's a great question. I think just to wrap up the, the formal part of the discussion and get to the Q&A, if you had one closing thought or provocative idea or plea for folks uh, who may be students or may have kids to think about uh, you know, what all of this means for future generations and maybe what we can do about it, I think that we're looking a lot at robots teaching children either by being a tool that they can use to learn how to interface with software, electronics, mechanics, coding, and I think that's brilliant, STEM, is just absorbing all these little things. And it's really fun to be able to build something you can interact with. I think on the other hand, um, we have to be careful that there is a story going forward with those, so it's not just teaching them electronics or something. I'll stop. Yeah. Well, I would say that you know the the policy lens on this is we, we enact policy that you know people care about. So we need to hear from the public, you know, as this is evolving over the next five, ten, fifty years, uh, what the things are people care about and how we sort of shape it so that we don't end up with Skynet and you know, World War II. I, I think I would echo that, and I, I think that designers. And if I may even add, urban planners, if we're to bring the transportation piece, have a special noblesse of liege, if you will, which is that we've always allowed technology to push us. Robots and the engineers and computer scientists who design them are really very good at getting tasks done. Designers are about designing life and all the things that go into it. So what I would ask designers to do <laughs> is, to come, is to come up with a vision of how do we want to live and then put automation to work to fulfill that vision so that we can live from zero to 100 plus with ease, convenience, but hopefully with just enough stress on us to keep us human and creative. That's a beautiful note to end on. Um, please join me in giving a round of applause to our panel.